But when you're giving your reviews, I also see you're very open and honest about going, hey, I like what I like. I don't like what I don't like. And Rich, sorry to expose this, but Matt thinks Lord of the Rings is overrated, for example. So Matt, Matt has his opinions. Well, by overrated. Well, uh, Austin, I also think that... Uh, <laughs> that- the Red Rising's overrated too, so we can we can get that. All can right, that eight. and he, that's he's, that's all the all time right, we yeah. have here today. That's uh, <laughs> we're good night and good luck. Pissed off both of us. <laughs> Welcome back, everybody. It's another Tudor Ramble episode. I'm one of your hosts, Austin, and I'm Richard. And here's what we're doing today, Rich. We are diving into the psyche of book reviewers, of what there's a big problem that we all share and we all have. And I am so happy that I don't just have to talk to you today again. Because we have a special guest, Matt. Hello, Matt. How you doing? I'm doing awesome. Thanks for having me on. Matt, of course, you Matt has a channel of his of his own, Matt's Fantasy Book Reviews. Go check him out. He's been lovely enough to come if on you and join want us. Expert opinions yeah. and not just Two, two rambling idiots. <laughs> Go check out Matt's channel. <laughs> I mean, I, I could argue, you just like, if you want to watch one rambling idiot talk, come over here. <laughs> <laughs> That's right, all fair game. And before we get into this big discussion, we're going to talk about like book reviewing in general, the the side that the audience typically doesn't see and what goes behind behind the screen a lot of the times. And the first thing to start off, Matt, you have your own book channel. Why did you start BookTube in general? What made you want to go out there and start reviewing books online? Um, so I had a um, I had a Goodreads account that was getting you know somewhat popularity to it, and you know I thought you know the reason I had that was so I could talk about books that I'm reading because I don't often read the newest books coming out. I'm reading old stuff. And it sucks because I don't like have anybody in my life to talk about books with because most of the people I know either don't read or they just don't read fantasy. And so I'm just stuck here dealing with it myself. So I'm like, let me just uh, figure out a platform where I can talk about what I'm into uh, selfishly and then uh, have that back and forth. And Goodreads wasn't really doing it for me enough. Um, it was more me shouting out to the world. And so <laughs> I said, hey, let me just, I have a webcam. Let me turn that thing on and see if anybody will uh, in, you know, engage with me talking about the stuff I'm into. And so uh, that's really, it was, that's how it all began. And you've got, so you have complete control on whatever book you want to review versus Rich and I, we typically have to go, let's, let's read this one, review it together. So there's a little bit of a, a duarchy here. It, it makes it a little difficult for us. Of, I can't just read whatever book I want and review it because if he hasn't read it, then and vice versa, he's going to get spoiled <laughs> when he edits the video. <laughs> Are you very careful of spoilers when you talk about books and you're very careful to go, hey, spoiler warning here, or how loose do you get? I typically, so I've kind of uh, created a, a niche for myself where I'm entirely spoiler free pretty much all the time. Uh, I've, I've started a little bit recently doing like a little five minute section at the end of my videos where I say, hey, spoiler time, and I throw up a tag at the bottom of the video and I talk about spoilers. Uh, but in general, I try to keep it spoiler free. Um, in part selfishly because it gets more views that way uh because ah. when people when you talk spoilers the only people that can watch that now are the people that have read that um when you talk spoiler free you get everybody um even people that have already read it before are still interested in watching that kind of video uh but the vast amount of people haven't read it yet and so just over time i figured that's the that's the trick yeah, something that, Rich, I'm going to speak for you. I think we've talked about this in the past because we knew mm-hmm. of your channel a while ago. We've been seeing, we're, we're familiar with the book too, and especially fantasy sci-fi. And we always see all your thumbnails, all your videos, and people can go check out Matt's channel. You always have your out of five-star rating with whatever you rated the book. And then here's the review, 10 to 20 minutes long, however it is. I like what when you go to your channel, you know you're getting a review and you don't hold your punches. You you give one stars. You give five stars. You let your opinions yeah. known. Oh, and right. I respect that. Oh, I, I appreciate actually giving a book a one star. Because so, yeah. that always frustrates me is kind of seeing where it's people review things. And so, for some reason, a two star doesn't exist. It's The only things that exist is three, fours, and fives. Eat, like, yeah, oh, they didn't like, like it. I, it's a three. The end of uh, book reviews. Yeah. 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 But no, you're actually touching on a real problem that I guess it's not a problem. It's just the way it is that we've run into as well of already BookTube itself is a small niche on YouTube itself, relatively speaking. 
And then you try and break that down even further into a specific book that, yeah, not everyone has watched that. So you're heavily limiting the pool of people that are actually going to watch your video if you do a spoiler. Yeah, keeping it spoiler free is keeping it so, hey, more people can at least look at this and click on this. Because Mm -hmm. do you ever hold back? If there's a book you read, you know, no one's read this book. It's not popular enough. I'm just not going to review it. I'm just going to keep my opinions to myself. Does that, do you ever self censor? a book and not review it because you know it won't get clicks. No, I I probably would if I put more effort into my videos. uh, (laughs) Relatable. (laughs) But but, I mean, really, my, like the style of video I do is hit record, finish the book on camera, close it, talk, click it off, edit it for 10 minutes, it's off. Um, And so I'm really only spending about 30 minutes from recording to editing, like of my time getting a review out. So that's, I mean, that's nothing. So it doesn't bother me to record a video knowing that very few people are gonna watch it. Cause it's like 30 minutes, who cares? Mm. And then I kind of have a kind of OCD personality type where it would frustrate me to have books that I've read not on the channel. Mm, so it's kind of like your own catalog. Yep. Got it. So people sometimes use Instagram to have neat photos and they go look through their life and they have, oh, look, this is what I was doing at that time. Yours is just a reading log, reading vlog. It, yeah. It's a better yeah. version of what Goodreads is supposed to be, really. Mm. Yeah, it's a really long form of uh, Goodreads. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Rich and I, here's, here's another thing to break down. So you go spoiler free. With your star system and your rating, how do you determine what you rate a book? Is it pure feeling? Is it pure... This I did not like this book. This gets a two. I hated this book. It gets a one. How do you determine where you star rank it for your audience and for yourself? Yeah, people kind of don't. I, I get some controversy around my star system because I don't have the same star system most people have. Um, it feels like, I mean, the star system that Goodreads tells you is ludicrous to me because Goodreads suggests that like a two star is still like a good book um, and it tears up from there. It's one star is like the only star for something bad. And I, uh, I don't agree with that at all. So I just have a very easy system where five star means I loved it. Four stars means I liked it. Three star is like, eh. Uh, two is didn't like it. And one is hated it or DNF'd it. And so keep it real simple. So that a three should be an average book. Okay. So it's not a, so I know a problem for us is when we try to put it into the five star scale, three being i don't know about you but Mm -hmm. it not being a true dead center right right out of five has bothered me to make a three an actual even that's why we personally do out of 10 just so that we can have a true five of oh yeah that book is dead average five out of (laughs) ten i I know it's it see this is something that only someone like you can probably appreciate in our sides of just being kind of anal retentive about the numbers of this thing and just how we actually catalog it in our own mind. If I gave zeros, which I don't, I would probably move to 10 because then I would get bothered by that. But on my, Mm. on my scale, there's really only, you know, there's only five things you could get with three being the middle. And do you, do you ever hold a punch and go, man, I'm going to get flagged for this one or you, you know the, the audience the, how much does the audience's reception and how much you know people are going to react to your ratings affect you at all do you think it does or do you think that you're completely immune to it i, I want to say i'm immune to it i i will say that if i'm reading a book where i feel like my negative comments could hurt that author on a financial side um, oh yeah mm-hmm. where yeah. it's a small author you know tiny I will still give the same score I would give. I'll say the general thoughts I would give, but I won't be as snarky. I'll I'll try to look for positives a little bit more. Um, But most of the books I read are authors that could not care less about what I say about them. And it will not impact them in the slightest. Um, And and if for the 95% of books I read that fall into that, eh, I'll do what I want. You know, I don't care. I'm not, I don't have any negative repercussions coming back at me. I don't, care if publishers don't send me a book or I hurt somebody's feelings. It's, I don't know. you feel the same as that? It honestly about the the exact same. I I have no problems uh, giving a scathing review of publishers that it's not going to affect their bottom line. Like, Hey, they're already established. It's fine. 
But if someone sends me a self-published book or it's a, a really small author, like it's not it. I, I would feel bad of actually writing a like doing a review on them and really trashing it. It, it for me, it's just better to not talk about the book. Like I, I I'm not going to be not honest and lie about the book, but I just won't say something if if it's a really small book. I, I feel it's just not appropriate to trash them i mean one thing i've noticed that's made me feel a little bit better about this about saying negative things about books uh, even if they're not huge and not make me feel as bad is that i've gone back and looked at the analytics on goodreads on some of the books that i've trashed that are not as big Mm -hmm. and they'll get a big spike of people you know saying i want to read this book even though i said i hated it because Mm -hmm. i might say things that are like oh matt hated it but you know some of the things he said are things that i might like um Matt, so, I mean, I mean this as a compliment. <laughs> I mean, I swear I do. I was, I clicked on, I clicked on one of your videos that was your ten most hated series or books of all time, and the top comment was, "I inverse all of Matt's opinions, all the books that Matt." It, so I read five of these and loved them. I'm just gonna inverse and buy the rest that he hated because we disagree <laughs> on every single one. And then Matt, you commented back, going like, "Glad I could help." <laughs> like, it was right. <laughs> So it, somebody out there could have the exact opposite opinion of you. So when you're given a review, obviously these are all subjective. Yeah. We try, we in our fairy land are going like, here, there's a right way to write. You know, you try to set your goalposts. That's a whole nother conversation. But when you're giving your reviews, I also see you're very open and honest about going, hey, I like what I like. I don't like what I don't like. And Rich, sorry to expose this, but Matt thinks Lord of the Rings is overrated, for example. So Ooh. Matt Matt has his opinions. Well, by overrated. Well, I, I, Austin, I also think that... Uh, that- the Red Rising's overrated too, so we can we can get that. All right, that and he, that's he's, that's all the all time right, we have here today. <laughs> that's uh, we're good night and good luck. Pissed off both of us. <laughs> <laughs> Just stir the pot. <laughs> yeah, but Matt, you, you have your taste, and you know what you like and don't like. And by the way, he gave it a four stars not, instead of five for Lord of the Rings. That, it's not yeah. like he, he doesn't hate. So not to put words in your mouth, Matt, but obviously we have our own likes and dislikes. And before we go back into, I want to talk about the number one problem book reviewers have here in a second. But I want to give Matt you an opportunity to pitch for us real briefly. Grace of Kings, we read book one. I know this is your favorite series. And yeah. we and book one was good. We really enjoyed book one, but we were so satisfied and cozy. We went, oh, we'll get to book two eventually. We liked the book. I, I, I almost... I didn't want to continue on because I was like, oh, this was just so good satisfying and good. Yeah. I, I don't... Why do I want to ruin that right, ending? Right. And without without spoiling that book one or the following books, is there so can you give a quick one-two punch to us of why to keep reading this series and why to push it to our TBR and everybody that's watching for Grace of Kings, that series, it's Dandelion Dynasty, right? Yes. That yeah. series to the top of their two TBR. Yes, I mean, I'd say especially to the, to this series is that the first book can be read as a standalone as you kind of experienced. It ends in such a beautiful place um, and kind of wraps up the story. But the first book is essentially a prologue to the trilogy that comes after it. Mm. And it's, to- it's entirely different. It's got a mm. new set of characters. Um, it's a totally different writing style. It, the first one reads like a very fast paced history of this world. Um, and the second one begins the story. And so I would tell you, if you did have that great feeling and you don't want to ruin it, don't go on um, because you might get ruined by it because you're, I don't know that there's a ton of people that are going to say that, you know, the trilogy that comes after it and that first book are equal. You'll find people feeling oftentimes that they end up hating the three books that come after it um, or they don't love the first one and they end up loving the next three. I I think I'm in that rare category that kind of likes all four of them. Um, But it's a very different thing. And I, I think you could just read the first one and be happy um, with what you got because it is a, it's a standalone. Huh. Is it, is it possible that people would feel this way mainly because of expectations of they read the first book and they absolutely loved it, a, a, everything it did. And because they, when they go into the second, the, you know, the second book and the rest of the trilogy, they're expecting that same thing and they're getting something completely different, even though it may be good it goes against their expectations. And so they end up not liking it. Yeah. I mean, expectations can wildly change your perception on something. And so I, I, you know, I think Richard, you, you touched on it really nicely. 
um, because it's just a, it's a wildly different thing. It slows down. It tells a long form narrative story. The first one is just action sequence to action sequence. Oh, let's uh, we're gonna go you know siege this castle. Next page. Ca- All right, castle siege. Let's move on. <laughs> um, where the second one is that normal. All right, let's you know let's plan this out. Let's go spend fifty pages talking about you know the back and forth here. And so yeah, expectations can totally throw people off. Um, it's hmm. one of the reasons I try not to have any expectations when I go into the books I read because fair, yeah. it, it can just totally throw you off. I, I agree that there's kind of two correct ways to go about starting into a book or a series. And it's one, be very, very accurate, get, get a good accurate take on what your expectation should be. So having the correct expectations of, okay, what type of story is, is it? Not what I want, but what is it? Mm-hmm. Or hearing what other people say and going in with that in mind or having absolutely none and just in your own head saying, like, I'm accepting it for what it is. What is it trying to do? Not what I want from it. Going blind. Yeah. There's plenty of books, like, but that's definitely the best way to look at it. My My personal moment of, oh, I think my expectations were wrong and maybe that really yeah. changed my opinion. I, I had like almost an epiphany moment with Name of the Wind. Uh, personally, I, I hated the book. I, I yeah. loved some aspects of it. So uh, the prose, amazing. There's a specific scene that everyone knows. It's a music scene. Made me cry. I loved that. Everything else in the story, I hated so much. But then I read Empire of Silence. And I was reminded so much of Name of the Wind and its structure, the characters, everything about it. And I liked that book. So I'm now here thinking, what are my expectations correct with Empire of Silence and wrong with Name of the Wind? That if I went in, if I reread Name of the Wind now with those different expectations, will I enjoy the book? And so I'm, has something like that ever happened to you where you changed your, changed your mindset and changed what you're looking for in the book, reread it and enjoyed it? Yeah, I mean, I don't reread a ton of books, um, but I'm currently going through that right now with the first law. I don't know if you guys have read any of the first law. I read uh, the first trilogy. Okay, so I, I read them and and I and I thoroughly enjoyed them, and now I'm going through them again and having a very different opinion on each of the books. Some of them I like more, some I like less, hmm. um, but I think it's because I know what's coming and I know what to expect and. You know, I'm not surprised by the same stuff, and I can see the foreshadowing going on, and so I, I get that, and I like it. Um, but in general, I just more than anything, I, I love reading a book that I know nothing about, uh, Agreed, like anything yeah. about it, other than what the cover looks like. What's and, the and, you know? What's the most recent one that you went into blind that you just kind of were floored that you knew nothing about it, and then you read it and were just blown away. A, a couple of weeks ago, I read this book. It's not super popular, but uh, by Larry Correa, and it's called uh, Son of the Black Sword. Um, he, I've I don't know if you guys that. have followed any of the Hugo controversy stuff, mm-hmm. but he was the guy that was at the center of the controversy, like, I don't know, six, seven years ago, where there was like voting blocks and people trying to control the voting. And uh, I didn't know this until after I read it, people told me. Uh, but I, I read that one because I do this thing on my channel, on my Patreon account, where people can put a book forward and I spin a wheel at the end of the month and whatever it lands on, I have to read it. And so every month there's at least a book that I'm totally clueless about. And and that was the winner of it. And so I just went in going, eh, I don't know anything about it. Let's just read it. Let's have fun. And it was amazing. And uh, Wow. Contrary I, to popular belief, Richard's saying on this podcast is, I'm giving you democracy. <laughs> <laughs> democracy is cringe, democracy is cringe, right? <laughs> yeah, we we let our patrons vote on a book that we still have to read each month. So Richard's our entire scheme here is yours is kind of a more risky gamble of anything could win. Just spin that wheel. That kind of ha- that that's exciting. Oh yeah, it, it, and uh, uh, Grace of Kings won. Oh, uh, oh okay, wow. that's and why it, you it, read it. One of my favorite series. So oh, that's great. Uh, I will also say that one of the Sarah J. Moss books won also, which was not an enjoyable experience. So you know, you get, you know, it, you, you win some. The wheel, stuff. the wheel giveth, and the wheel taketh away. <laughs> <laughs> but Luke, we kind of brushed on this earlier of the, this problem that 
book reviewing has in general. I think there, there's two things to consider or two, two things that are always going on in our mind. One is the author, the little bit, the effect of how, how, how much of what I think should I actually say? And to the audience, since you're not just sitting chatting with friends going like, ah, this is, this is what I think of the book. Like you can, you can influence how a book does at a certain point, especially with the bigger your audience is. So for example, yeah. you, you even hating a book led more people to going and buying that book. That's just going to happen. But does, does anything with the audience ever affect? So, you know, the viewership and you know, you're curating this toward whether it's a spoiler free or spoiler full review. Do you ever curate this in a way that tends to a certain audience or how much does their, them viewing what you're saying compel you to say certain things or maybe not just change your words, but how honest can you actually be? No, it's a good question. I think I'm probably radically on the side of, I truly don't care um, what people think <laughs> about me. And, you know, I, I just, I don't care. And so when, it's worked on the inverse. Like I've done a couple <laughs> reviews where I've crashed on really popular books mm. and I've gotten the most hateful comments that, that could, that you could think of. I mean, just like horrific comments and all it's done is make me hate the book more. And whenever I bring it up <laughs> in the future, it's like, Hey, I was going to say some bad things, but now I'm going to tear in, it into shreds um, just to annoy you. And so I've gone kind of on the other end of it where I try to piss people off that I, I feel it. like deserve it a little bit, but that's about it. I will. You know, I, I, I'm never going to say really positive things about something. If I know a lot of people want to hear that or vice versa, I will not be talking about red rising this episode. <laughs> I will, I'll shut uh, up. <laughs> I know for us, it's nothing. Um, the, the whole YouTube and the, audience kind of thing has never affected my opinion on the the pause like where i will say something positive that i actually felt negative about yeah. but i know it has affected me on the choice of next book i'm going to read there's sometimes where i i can only read so many books in a month and i'm going uh ah, what would do well uh what would what would the audience particularly like us to read and so there's several books that keep falling by the wayside for me where i almost have a split in my reading schedule is there's books I have to read for YouTube. And then there's sometimes I occasionally get to fit in a fun book for me. Uh, one of them that I'm currently reading through now is, um, uh, Oh, the, the fourth book in Brandon Sanderson's skyward series. Okay. It's not going on the channel. It, it's a, it's the fourth book of a series that he hasn't started yet. <laughs> it's never going to be reviewed. However, I just wanted to finish it and I know it's, that's just kind of gone in the way sometimes where I will yeah, yeah. self-select what book I read because of YouTube. Yeah. I, I know that's a, that's an issue for me. Yeah, and you, well, it sounds like for you, Matt, like your structure is different. You don't have to have, you know, a co, a co-host that you have to kind of sync up with. So you get a to friend. just say, yeah, uh, yeah a friend co-host, uh, you get to just say what you want. Cause it's only you. <laughs> well, you guys are in a little bit different situation than I am as well, because you know, you get a, you get a lot of views on your review stuff because you do more long form stuff and you're, you're filling a, a niche that doesn't really exist. Um, I don't know that there's anybody doing what you guys are doing, which I think has helped you get massive popularity in a short amount of time. I mean, you guys have, I, I do it. A, I do a lot of tracking on people to see what works and what doesn't work. And you guys have cracked the code um, way faster than anybody I've seen. But you do, it's, it's because you're doing something so different. And mm -hmm. so I can see that impacting you guys because your, your reviews are legitimately can get a wildly different amount of views based on what, what you're reading. For somebody like me, I know that my book reviews aren't going to catch the algorithm. They're, I've never done a review that's ever going to get it. I'm getting reviews. Be, I'm getting like watches on my channel because I have my subs watching and because people are searching for that thing, but it's, YouTube's not going to promote my stuff. They are going to promote my, you know, top 10 lists, you know, the, you know, the mm -hmm. tier rankings, the 30 second type video yeah. stuff like that. Right. Um, but for my reviews, it's, they're all going to get between the same, you know, ballpark of views. So it, I, it doesn't impact my line of thinking at all. Well, you could always go into manga. But, bro. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. oh, no. 
I think I touched a nerve. Oh no. <laughs> we we probably have similar feelings of eh, it's not it's not the complete sabler. I I read manga too. Like I it's fine, but I don't think that we're ever going to have manga like a full actual manga review on this channel. Well, uh, you know what? It, this is it's also it's the forbidden it's the forbidden fruit of booktube. Like I know that we could do it and we'll get views for it. Like it, it, we, it just takes one. We just have to review Berserk. But w what comes with that? Of going down that path, we're going to see the views and go, "Oh my god, that was so much easier." And we're going to be tempted to stray from the light. No, I, it, I'm just going to do a little fentanyl. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's that whole debate between <clears throat> business and pleasure. Because obviously we all like reading books. That's why we, we like sci-fi fantasy. Hey, if we liked manga, we'd go do a manga channel. Like Murphy, she's doing manga because she likes manga. Yeah. And she really wants to talk about it and review it. Mm -hmm. What we really get, like to get into is fantasy, sci-fi, books, books of that sort. So it's that whole debate between how much of YouTube, how much of this reviewing thing, Matt, do you, are you making a business and how much do you have business mind on versus how much do you have, I'm just having a fun time on. It seems like you lean way more than most on the, I'm just having a time and you know the money I make from it good and all that's all positive. Is that accurate? Yeah. I mean, I, not to get into specifics, but like I have a successful career. Uh, what's that like <laughs> and I the, the money that I could ever make from YouTube is never going to get even close to like my career money so it's like I don't care like, it's, <laughs> I, I'm not making business decisions on this channel and quite frankly I think my channel has grown in large part because of my mindset um, because I think you know a lot of people have the other mindset right they're mm -hmm. trying to force something that is not natural to, mm -hmm. to make these decisions. And a lot of time it backfires. It's just, be they just become just like everybody else. And then they don't stand out and there's nothing that differentiates them. And then, you know, people have 60 options and they're just one of the 60. So it, it happens to work for me. I think it ends up making me more money having this perspective than if I did the other way, just, I lucked out with, with that i think well i know being in the booktube space and kind of hearing what our patrons um like think about you is you just have such a very positive perception because it's just so unadulterated of like you know what you're getting matt like you're just gonna get a bunch of reviews it, there's a lot of book reviewers out there that just i just want to review it's all i want i just want book reviews but at the and same, yeah that's true that is Hey, fill in that need where a lot of people get frustrated with this, some book booktubers are going like, where are the more book reviews? <laughs> the, da the Daniel the question, right? Like, yeah. So Daniel Green, it makes complete sense though because he's this is where he makes his money now, full time job. So like the, the, the fantasy, can, the the yeah. fantasy book uh, news, the fantasy news. So of course yeah. it's a business decision, and also he wants to intertwine what he likes to do and i think the big the best thing he did was publishing his own book having a good income from that so now he can kind of he's so big now he can start reviewing and i love that he's doing what mm -hmm. he wants to do that's what you should oh no should. He, he's mixing it i know it's something we've definitely made a lot of effort of doing <laughs> yeah, is yeah, yeah. we have to combine mostly what we like to do and what what we're passionate about mixed with the understanding of what an audience wants. Mm. But if we just go straight into, oh, let's just do what the audience wants, we'll lose ourselves and ultimately, in the long run, not be very successful. Exactly as you're saying, Matt, yep. where that you lose that portion, you don't become different enough. And I, I do want to hark back on, remember when he called us popular for a second? It felt pretty good. It felt. I just wanted to take that one. Like no one in high school's ever said that. College, no. Nope. <laughs> Finally, we're, I, that's going to be we're, a clip. I'm going to clip that just it, for myself. Uh, me first. <laughs> I just. I just wanted to hark. I, 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 I do want to clarify that statement. Like you're popular among the nerds. Oh come on! Oh, what, the, what the hell is that? Chill, don't take it back. <laughs> oh damn it! <laughs> no, we are Actually, among the nerds. The, it, the thing is, nerds is a good word. And I like how us nerds have taken that word and made it a positive. <laughs> it's good. It used to nerd used to be bad twenty years ago. Like I ah, nerd geek. Now oh. it's, it's like nerd geek. It's more. Acceptable. I don't know about you, but trying to like. I love the book community because yeah, yeah. same thing with you, Matt, is the reason, like one of the big reasons why I wanted to do this YouTube channel is 
when I was reading a bunch of books, I had no one else to talk to about it. And going on Reddit, the main thing that sparked it for me was Wheel of Time. Is I was going through and I just desperately wanted someone to talk to about Wheel of Time as I was going through the books. And Reddit just wasn't scratching that itch for me. Trying to get my friends more into they started reading Stormlight, which was fun. But that's the big the biggest thing is now we have our our Discord community, which if you're interested in signing up for, you can click that link down in the description. Such a good plug. Join our book club. It's fun for you and me. Look at that. <laughs> Look how good I'm getting. Hey, Matt's got his own Patreon over there. Go support him. Put a book on his wheel for him to read. It'll be fun. After us, of course. <laughs> um, but no, that, that's been the biggest benefit for me personally is having that community to actually talk about books. Absolutely, yeah. And it's it's honestly spoiled me a little bit where it's gave it's given me the wrong um, perception or just expectations again. I have now been just so into talking about fantasy books and sci-fi all the time. We're now where I go out into the real world. Yeah. Realizing that most people just don't have my interest. And I start just going, man, I don't have a lot to talk about. I, I, <laughs> I, my head is oh just full God. of sci-fi. Matt, Matt, you should see Richard at a party. It's hilarious. <laughs> it's, it is a good time. <laughs> it always gravitates towards fantasy, somehow gets in there. And then we're just in the corner. And we're like, oh, dang. <laughs> It's wonderful. <laughs> no, no, I'm I'm in the same boat. I work in like a I work in politics, and so I'll get these people that are like, "Hey, have you read the new like Theodore Roosevelt biography?" And it's like, <laughs> "No, I don't." There's no magic system. <laughs> <laughs> uh, hey, was not not Teddy, but was it uh, Ben Franklin who is a time traveler? That was your theory, right? So oh, that, that could get sci-fi-ish, right? That is my personal theory. I I, I like to think that. There's some things that you can just choose to believe because it, it's more you get fun. to cultivate your own reality. Mm -hmm. Sometimes, yeah. like especially if it's non consequential, like look, I'm not going to believe like stupid stuff, but like oh, you know, vaccines cause autism or something like that's that's stupid thing to believe in. But believing that Benjamin Franklin is actually a time traveler that doesn't negatively affect my life, and it makes the world better in my eyes. I, I just think it, it's way more fun. <laughs> uh, mo a lot of history, too, and I, I'm not into historical fiction as much, and I know the Gwynn brothers who we've had on, they're great as well. Might as well just plug every channel. <laughs> <laughs> but the Gwynn brothers, they're really into historical fantasy, historical fiction, and a yeah. lot of history is kind of guessing a little bit, too. Of like <laughs> we, have, we have some contemporary sources, and you can kind of look at history and edge into more belief, like Hannibal and the Elephants. Like, how much is that true? Mm. All of it. I like to say all of it. Yeah. Like he had thousands of them. <laughs> I choose just, to believe the fun history. Yeah, yeah. Why? Why get bit? Like especially because I'm not a historian. I'm not actually doing the research. It's not consequential to you. I might as well believe the most fun version of history. Right. right. As long as it's not like actually negative from the opposite of truth. <laughs> right. It's just fun. Think there's more elephants. But that where'd that tangent come from? What were you saying? Matt? God, we ramble on. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> that, or clipping that too. No, no idea. No, no. no. <laughs> uh, Richard, bring us back to reality. We were talking about the community, and I. So yeah. I was talking about my. The biggest benefit for me is mm -hmm. having a community to yeah. read books with. How has that affected you? So, like, uh, of course, the YouTube comments, you're actually able to interact with people when you do reviews. Uh, do you really enjoy your Patreon? Do you talk a lot with them on your Patreon? I, I do a lot more on, on Discord. Um, so, you know, I spend a lot of time in between reading books, talking to people on Discord. I've kind of shot myself in the foot a little bit because I do this uh, this contest every month where people guess what I'm going to rate the books I read. Um, and then if they get right multiple times, they get various things. But it's made it so I can't talk about them as much while I'm reading them. Um, uh, because uh... then it kind of ruins the surprise. But I, when I'm done, it's nice to kind of go out there and be able to, like, talk about it. It's so nice being able to, like, have a whole huge group of people that have already read something you've read and can back go back and forth with you but right. I, I like the discord format a little bit more because you can actually go back and forth um where on youtube i don't know about you guys but i'm so backlogged on my youtube comments that it's almost like i can't keep up uh like i went on vacation one time and i came back with hundreds of comments and i'm like all right it's over can't do it. <laughs> uh <laughs> And yeah so now i just respond a little bit but then you don't get notifications on youtube on somebody responding back to you um, yeah, I, I don't know why that 
on that, that studio seemed, tab? Yeah, the studio tab's weird. You have to go to actually YouTube and get the notification. It's, it's yeah. bad. Yeah. Uh, we've had that problem as well. It's hard if you were saying, like, I've tried to reply to people, and then two months later I see them. Like, oh, God, that's messed up yeah. there. Yeah, uh, and you'll hear somebody be like, oh, Matt doesn't respond to anybody. I was like, I, I didn't see it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> now, you're, we're talking about a lot of pros here of, of BookTube and reviewing books. Can you... Is there really any negative for you, Matt? Because you've been very positive about a lot of this. So what's what's a bad, what's the dark side of reviewing to the public, to the masses? To What would you call them, Richard? Uh, the peons, the peasants. Uh, there you go. The so rabble. What, what, what would <laughs> be a negative? Has you, have you seen any negatives that have been affected by you from just public reviewing? I mean, the couple I can think of is... It, I, they haven't impacted me as much, but I, I could like see how it would impact somebody is when you get hateful comments and that's never fun, you know, and I've seen it impact people and be really, you know, hit them hard. I, I just, I don't, I, I've never, I mean, at least after I like got married and had kids, I stopped just kind of caring about what anybody thinks about me outside of my family. Um, and so that, I, I'm kind of immune to that, but I'd say the negative comments can suck and there, there's no way to avoid them, especially if you're honest. Not um, one of our negative comments has hurt you. Not one of them. <laughs> <laughs> we, we've tried several videos. <laughs> no, you're going to have to ramp it up a little bit. Okay. Um, <laughs> All right. But I, I'd say the other one that stressed me out at the beginning, and we touched on it a little bit, but this idea, especially when I was uh, do, mostly on, on Goodreads was you get these authors that'll reach out and they'll send you a book. And okay. early on I was like, Oh, this is awesome. I've hit the big time, got free books coming my way and you read it and it just sucks. Mm. And it's like, what do, now, now what do I do? You know, I, I don't want to trash this guy who's gave me something for free. And gotcha. you, you end up in this moral dilemma of, look, they just provided me a service. They probably spent, I don't know, 20, 30 bucks getting this book into my hands. And now I'm now not only did they waste money, but now I'm saying something negative about them. Mm. that's hard for me to deal with, uh, internally. I ended up just making a principle that I just don't accept books. Um, mm. I, if you want to send me a book, I'm, I, I tell you up front, I, Hey, I'm not going to read it. I'll show it off in one of my videos. I'll show it off in a re recap video. I'll read the back cover. I'll give you a little promotion, but I will not be reading it. Um, and that kind of solved the problem that I was going through. Good. But I see a lot of people getting into this scenario and I wonder how they deal with it because I see them reviewing the book that got offered to me. I know they got offered it. And it's like, well, what do you, you know, are, are you being honest? Um, and if you're not, you know, you got to live with that. And this stress of like, how am I making somebody feel? Cause I don't want to make people feel bad. Yeah. Rich, have you had a similar negative as have you had the similar feelings as Matt? I kind of just the stress of, yeah. When people send you books, like one, you feel a a little obligated to read it because they sent it to you, but then you just can't. There's too many of them. Like there's just pure numbers game. I can't read them. I I, I have to pick, and well, so they, and they probably suck. Right? And I mean, it's... yeah. I mean, there are some gems in there occasionally, but yeah, <laughs> most often. Or in all honesty, the almost the worst case scenario. Like if it really sucks, like in your case if you really disliked it, at least there's like some emotion there of really disliking it. And so people will go check it out. Yeah. There's plenty of them out there where it's like, it's okay. And almost nothing is worse of a review than Apathy. it's okay. Like yeah. I, I feel nothing about it. It wasn't great. It was, wasn't really bad. It was just existed. That's not good for them. That's not good for YouTube and like entertaining. It's just not worth it to me because I'm looking at like I'm not providing any value to anybody doing that. I'm at least providing value telling people like, hey, I think this is good. This is why. Or, hey, I think this is bad. And here's why. Me just saying, eh, I, I just don't. So how, man, how do you deal with that? Because that's your three star reviews is eh, it was all right. So do you kind of narrate that in a way where you talk about the pros and cons or how do you make that more interesting to shoot a video about that? Uh, so yeah, three star reviews are going to be the lowest viewed of uh, all of my reviews. The highest are going to be my one star reviews and then the five stars. Um, 
and then two stars, then four stars, and three stars. It's like, who's watching that? Why do they care? Right. Um, I, I do kind of a uh, a not awesome thing, and I've never talked about this with anybody with my three stars. Ooh. Is, so I, uh, I get these companies that reach out that want me to do like a sponsorship with them, mm-hmm. and I'll always pitch the sponsorship type of saying like, look, pay me X amount of money for every thousand views I bring you. And like half the companies are like, cool. And then I'm really motivated to get that into a video that's going to perform really well. Uh, but for the people that are like, no, we'll just send you a flat check of X dollars. I'm like, sounds good. You're going in a three-star video. Oh, uh. I like how you put this at the 40 minute mark where no sponsor's going to see this. <laughs> <He's just> like, <laughs> like, first off, they'd have to click on a two to ramble video and then, <laughs> then they have to go 40 minutes in. So good, good, good placement there. And that's, mo- that's mostly you just guessing like, Hey, if it's being sent to me, it is, more than likely going to be a three star. You may be surprised, mm. but more than likely, it's going to just be a three star anyway. Yeah, I mean, you know, there there are times where I'll want to read a book and I'll like have heard good things about it and I'll reach out to the author and say like, hey, can you send me a review copy? Heads up, I might not like it. You know, there's your there's your disclaimer. And I'm if I don't like it, I'm not going to rate it well. And they always send it. And then I then I'm kind of like, solve the problem for myself mm. and most authors are like that's cool man that's all i want just be honest that's great um, yeah and so it, th- that's the one time i'll take books is when i like reach out to somebody and tell them like hey gotcha yeah we had that mistake earlier on where we were accepting books and saying you know we're going to read these and give you a f- i mean this is when we were much smaller so could actually do this and then quickly hit a point where that's not feasible and if anything, I think the biggest negative for me, maybe you guys feel this as well. Sometimes, actually, Matt, maybe you less so because when Rich and I, we have to come on here and review a book or do something for a book club. Sometimes I'll have to speed read, you know, still reading the book, but sometimes oh, there's yeah. a time crunch because this has to be read by this time. And of course, that's going to affect, you know, just reading for pleasures. You could take your time, yeah. enjoy the scene, but sometimes there's a deadline. And it can, doesn't feel like homework because I still love sci-fi fantasy. It's still fun, but you just have to read faster than otherwise you would have sat there and enjoyed it more. Yeah, no, that's definitely happened to me. I, I remember one of our <laughs> time war. The, we re- I read, I read uh, this is how you lose the time war. On in, a time crunch. <laughs> in one day, like the day of book, the, of our, I was doing other things. And so I Couple started hours. reading the book that morning before book club <laughs> and I finished it. <laughs> <laughs> oh god <laughs> i still loved it I, I still really enjoyed the book yeah, yeah. but i knew but like i wish i had some more time to like slow down on this there's some lines in here that i wanted to digest mm-hmm. and i just didn't have the time i had to so go you're like i will not lose the time war <laughs> <laughs> i will not lose the time war. <laughs> Matt, do you have to deal with that at all since it's a one-man team it's less it's less deadline necessary no and i so i i'm Like, again, I'm kind of OCD about my reading habits. And so I have like a spreadsheet that I plug in the books and it tells me when I'm going to finish it based on my reading habits. Oh, wow. And it updates over time based on how quickly I've been reading things recently. And so I kind of know when I'm going to finish it. um, You mind sending that over to us? We are not the same. (laughs) This is. is... I would not mind mind something like that. Please. I read read about the same amount every day. Um, Okay. You know, can I structure Mm -hmm. my day out? And so I know about how much I'm going to read. So I know how, you know, about what it's going to take. Yeah. So I'll always hit my day within, you know, one day early, one day late, but always within that time frame. And you've never, have you ever felt fatigue? Have you ever felt tired of reviewing for once? You're like, ah, this one, I just, I don't want to, I don't want to do it. I'm not feeling it. Not really. It, mostly, I mean, I would do that if, again, if I like, if the editing process took me a while, like I was watching um, Bookborn. I don't know if you guys follow Bookborn. Oh, yeah, we've had her on here. We love her. She's yeah. great. But she just released a video where she went over all her finances, which yes. is really mm-hmm. entertaining. But she said something that I, I literally had my jaw dropped. And she said, yeah, on my simple uh, reviews, it'll take me about 10 hours to edit. Um, and on my long form stuff, it's like 40, 50 hours. And I was like, oh, my God. Like, yeah, she was- preps. Oh yeah, she, she, her videos are researched. They are informative, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it takes a lot of effort on the back end. Where her actually recording is the shortest part of actually making the video. Do I have that right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and yeah, whereas, yeah. Well, by far the shortest. I mean, she'll yeah. make a ten minute video and said it takes her ten times longer to edit it than it took to record. Yeah, uh, there, that is. There's totally a real. To me. There's a real spectrum between you 
us and Bookborn. <laughs> yeah. Like we're somewhere between Matt and Bookborn. Yeah. We're somewhere there. And <laughs> it depends on the day, right? Yeah. But that, that I mean, is... I, I don't know that I've ever taken more than an hour to edit a video. I mean, that would be... That would, that would take the fun out of it for me if I was mm. spending a lot of time doing that. But I'm also lucky in the sense that I've never um, put the expectation out there that you're going to get this really edited product. So people don't care because they know what they're going to get out of the gate. Um, I'm glad I made that decision up front um, because I'd be kind of screwed. <laughs> right, right. Because for obviously we have a longer form podcast, so the longer yeah. the video, longer to edit. I'm sure you had a longer video recently, like the 30 second one. I'm sure that took yeah. a bit longer than usual because there was I have to clip this all together, or did you just kind of sit there, record it, and then edit the beginning and ending, and not have to stitch in a bunch in the middle? I didn't. I don't ever stitch anything, so I always have a template on my intro and outro. So that's just sitting there ready for me. I place in the videos, I clip the very beginning, I clip the end, and then it's just in there. The only thing that takes time is me putting in book covers. Um, but I save all the book covers as I'm reading them in a fi file. So it's really easy to just plug them in and throw them in the right spot. Hmm. Um, okay. Yeah. I mean, then yeah. talk, being honest then about Bookborn having that video of saying she makes three, made $3 an hour. Great title, by the way. I was like, Oh, that's it. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and oh. Would you recommend to anybody out there that's thinking, Matt, they're like, I want to I want to start a book review channel. Would you say to start it for, obviously, if you're passionate about it, start it. But would that's you... That's first. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the you first have to You have to, you, want, you have you have to, to want to do, to do it. it rather than like, oh, I'm going to get in for the money. No, no. <laughs> Wrong place to start. <laughs> yeah. well, what advice would you have given to yourself just starting? What advice would you give to someone that says, I want to start a booktube channel. Here's what, what's my next step. What do I do, Matt? Buy a decent microphone. Don't worry about a camera. Just make your sound like like good. Like I can't tell you how many people s tell me they don't actually watch the video. They just play it in the background on their true like while they're driving or something or listening to it. So invest in a microphone and it just start doing it. Practice. Uh, don't care about what it looks like, what it sounds like. Just get reps in, and you'll figure it out as you go along. There's Little tweaks you'll make along the way that make it better over time, but don't just don't have any expectations. Don't care about what who's watching it, what it looks like. Just look around there, see if there's little changes you can make here and there. The product mm -hmm. will over time get a lot better, um, and you'll actually be proud of it over time. But just throw it out there, see what happens, see what sticks. Yeah, yeah. you agree with that? Yeah. Strategy without action is worthless, mm. and so. Yeah, it's much better to act first in these type of things than change it over time. Yeah, but, but I mean, yeah. I certainly don't go with any expectation that you're going to make any money. I mean, oh, yeah. most, most channels don't make any money. Well, right? it's not even just the money thing. It's a lot of people, they just want their effort to be seen. So I know yeah. like that that's definitely can be disheartening as you put in a lot of work into a video and just nobody sees it. And that could be really just like, why did I work so hard for something that like, barely anyone saw just like a yeah, I, I, that you just have to get over it of like the first 20 20 of your videos are just not going to be seen you just have to do them anyway and push through yeah I, I feel bad for people that hit that wall um i try to provide encouragement to people and comment on their videos especially the smaller they are the more i kind of try to push them along mm -hmm. um, but i feel bad because that, that happens a lot. I think a lot of people just don't see that instant success and they peter out. I'd say one other advice I'd give to people is like, try to create another platform before you get on YouTube to drive to your YouTube. So that oh. you're actually getting views from, mm -hmm. the, from out of the gate. Like I had good reads. Like I, I was at the time, like one of the, they rank you on Goodreads, but like one of the top five, 10 us reviewers in terms of views. Wow. Cause I gamed the system and figured out how to make people watch my stuff. Um, <laughs> But, but then when I started a YouTube channel, I just went and edited all my Goodreads reviews and said, hey, here's my channel. Um, and so right out of the gate, I got a bunch of subscribers that were interested in my stuff. And so I never had to hit that, you know, confidence wall that I think most people have to go through. Yeah. So Got it. Diversity of platforms yeah. is definitely important. I know for us starting out, TikTok was a big help early on yeah. in getting some people into our channel. And for sure. definitely worked. Yeah, shorts. Are you general. getting conversions from TikTok over to your YouTube channel? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Uh, we yeah. we get uh, conversions that go from, and we've talked to some patrons that go from TikTok to YouTube to Patron, 
or sometimes just from straight from TikTok to Patreon. Huh. And it's really interesting that it, it, it's it's a funnel. It's a kind of like a funneling system, but yeah, you got. I mean, I, I've watched. I'm, I'm not on TikTok. Uh, my my wife is. She tells me to get on it all the time, but. <laughs> I watch YouTube shorts and stuff, but you, it seems like you kind of have content or maybe you're just really good at finding it. That seems like it'll appeal in that short minute long format. You know, I, I don't know that I have uh, fair clips that would be, make me an interesting person to listen to, but I don't know. It's maybe we just have so much. So if in an hour podcast, it's stitching in a five minute segment into a minute. So it's really just using all the jargon we say and cutting out the st- nonsense like um but which we're still trying to get over and getting yeah. through that and getting the there's also there's also a game of once you start playing around and you see some success you could start gleaning of hey what do i need to put right in that first second the first two seconds of a video to yeah. get uh people to continue on because it's often that so and that's similar with uh youtube of your first five to 30 seconds on youtube is the most important section of the video that if yeah. if you can get a viewer to sit through thir- the first 30 seconds there's a much stronger likelihood they're going to watch a lot much larger chunk but if they cut out at that first 30 seconds then barely anybody's going to watch well I, I you're you're right i also find that that can end up making a trap for you where i don't know i hate to call the guy out but like Go watch one of Daniel Green's early videos mm-hmm. where his real personality is showing because that's, you know, unvarnished, no expectations. That's who he is. And then watch what happened over time where he started to get all eccentric and loud and, you know, these fast cuts and what, at least in, in my perception, trying to game it and not being authentic to who he is. Mm-hmm. I see this happen to so many people. And I think it's that intro thing. And they're like, they're following the, the analytics so much and saying, I got to be in your face. I got to be loud. I got to be something that isn't true to themselves. Um, and so I, I don't know. I've always worried about how much do I obsess over that intro and how much will that impact the product I'm giving and who I am? I sure, get you. So, so when we go, welcome back to the <laughs> Well, I would say the tweak is yeah. not, you don't have to be, loud bombastic that is one way to do it early on to get that easy attention but probably more important is that first five to 30 seconds you are very clear on what the point of the video is like you give people the valid expectation like what am i expecting out of this video first chapter of a book am i going to you you deliver the promise hey here's the title of the video here's the thumbnail first 30 seconds kind of gives you hey this is what it's about and not just kind of aimless where it's off point that those first 30 seconds, yeah. you need to actually be on point with what the video is talking about. And the yeah. point about being true to yourself as well. So Daniel green, this being his business and everything, I could see the point of, Hey, are you still who you were back then five years ago? There's the point. If you look at our videos, when we first started, I'm definitely a lot more comfortable on camera than I was a mm-hmm. year and a half, two years ago. So how much of it is being more comfortable? How much of it, is like knowing that certain things you say will get more views because this is part of your business and how much of that pie goes together to be how you act mm-hmm. in front of the camera. I don't know. What what do you both think about that? Is it being more comfortable? Is it knowing what does well? What do you guys think? Richard, go ahead. Well, uh, so I, I used to do theater in high school, both community and in school. Yeah. And there's something interesting about... I, I would kind of focus on the makeup of it and how you act on stage that when you're on a stage, you have to act a l- not completely differently, but 15% more than what you do. If, if you're in the front row, the person in the front row can easily see you, but the person in the back is going to have trouble seeing you unless you act a little bit more, you move your hands a little bit wider. you, make your face a little bit more clear. You make it's, it's not a lie. It's just more. So the people in the back can see you properly and get the, get the attention. I kind of see the same thing with the camera is 
I don't have to be different. I just have to be a little bit more. I have to be clearer with my words instead of just kind of me being more reserved where someone can see the subtle uh, movements of my face that you see in normal conversation. With a camera, there's that distance. You can watch comments back on our old videos. It was like, man, Richard was mellow. Yeah. <laughs> because you're, you're a much calmer person, but obviously you project more. Like, I, engage, well, no, I you, still feel the same yeah, yeah, thing. You're just but, engaging more in the conversation. You're being more attentive. You're, you're going, okay, I'm, I'm, on a, I'm on a stage. I'm not just, I'm not backstage right now. I'm on stage. It's properly getting like all the things in the early videos that I had in my head and the words I'm saying was not being properly getting across that trying to get your message across with just purely words where you're monotone is not effective communication. Hey, I'm sure you're familiar. You're in politics, right, Matt? So public speaking in general, I'm sure yeah. you know plenty about public speaking. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I think I agree in, in, in part in that it, there is that initial shock of how do I talk to somebody that's not there? And <laughs> I'm, you know, I'm, I'm talking to a camera. And it's, it's weird. Like I, I, I literally had to put like a, one of my daughter's like uh, dolls on top of my camera so that I could train <laughs> myself to talk to it. That's great. Because I'd just be wandering all over the place, uh, you know, cause there's nothing there, but I'd say that after you you have a good handful of videos out that you've, now you've kind of crossed that threshold of I, I've learned how to talk. I've learned how to be natural and be myself where I was a little more reserved and shy. But after you have like a good handful of videos out, if you're still modifying your personality type, th there's a certain point where you're just chasing views at that point. You're chasing the algorithm and saying like, what did I do about this video that worked from a personality type? And I don't know, man, I, I, I judge some of those people and mm -hmm. I'm not going to say who they are. There's a lot of them. Uh, where it's like, man, I know that if I just had a beer with you, you wouldn't be acting like this. I know. He, did you see how he looked at us right then? I know. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, I, I, I actually completely understand your point. Like you, you can see that difference. I know with myself, I've, I have changed the way I communicate, but it hasn't just affected my, uh, in, pers in my whole impression on camera it's affected the way I just talk with other people. I, I think yeah. I'm a better communicator. You're right. That I actually am expressing myself. My thoughts are the same, but instead of just like not looking people in the eye, actually using hand motion and trying to get my point across clearly, that doing that in front of the camera has helped my in-person communication. Definitely. And so I, I don't know if it's like there is that persona. Like I, I can think of, if you're catering to a much younger audience in the gaming space, like you can tell oh, like right. that's a personality and like, yeah. they are not that way right. versus, you know, they're just a bit more excited and they're just a bit more clear on camera. So I, I completely understand your point though, Matt. I, don't, I, I get the impression that if we were all hanging out together, you'd probably be acting very similar to the way that you're acting right now. Similar, um, but maybe I wouldn't be as, energy or clear because there there's a sense of when I'm on camera, I feel the need to properly get myself across that I need to be more clear than if I'm in person. If I'm in person, I just, there's a little bit less energy. You know, I have the time to just really talk it out. And if I'm not, if I'm not on the ball, if I'm not really focused, I have the time to, for someone to understand me versus yeah. The camera doesn't can't respond. You're saying, you're saying it's that 15% projection. It's the being not louder, but being more attentive. Attentive. You're focused really hard. Like, on this how is you're what talking. you're doing right now. You are recording a video. This well, is what's a conversation yeah. allows someone to give you feedback in yeah. real time if you're being understood. A camera can't. There's do that. no feedback. Then. So you have to actually, yeah, especially focus for on it. Matt, because at least we get feedback from each other. Yeah, I can go. Okay, that that's where I, maybe the conversation comes off more like that because it being a podcast and we could talk back and forth and say, "Oh, Richard reacting negatively again," <laughs> <laughs> but then Matt's looking at the camera and going, eh, "Here's my review." <laughs> so it's got to be so much different. Yeah, that's it's totally different format we're doing. So yeah, yeah I, I can see what you're saying. Yeah, and Matt, I don't want to take too much of your time, but can can I leave us with this? I want I had a little thing planned here. For oh, the okay. End. You plan things? And, no. <laughs> <laughs> I'll ask I'll ask Matt this first, and Rich, I'll ask it to you last. Okay. Yeah. 
Matt, do you have any channel goals for this year? Do you have anything, anything you want to achieve, not just number wise, but maybe you want to have a certain person on your podcast, or sorry, on your channel, <laughs> or have a certain ARC come to you, or anything to do with the channel and book community? Do you have any goals for this year? Yeah, I uh, I want to do more interviews with uh, with authors. I don't know that they're going to perform terribly well, but it's something I, I, I want to do from a selfish perspective where I just want to talk to authors. I think it's a cool opportunity that I'd never be able to have before um, where I'm probably at the point now where I can get most authors outside of like Sanderson to say, yeah, we can, we can chat. Um, and that from a fanboy perspective, I think that'd be awesome. And I was embarrassed about doing that before because my camera setup was like just a webcam. And I finally invested in something that allows me to, you know, allow my laptop to record it from my normal camera. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, and that's like, that's brand new. And so I, I, I want to do that. I want to, I feel kind of shy about it where I want to kind of in, in, increase my confidence in being able to talk to people that I kind of look up to and am, am impressed by. So that's my big goal for this channel this year is kind of have the confidence to go invite some of my favorite authors on and talk about the books I love. That's great. And I did preface it saying not a numbers thing, but if you could pick a number for subscribers at the end of the year, <laughs> where, where would you want to be at? And not that I know you have your own career. This isn't the most important thing, but if you could set a nice goal to be like, Hey, that's a good thing to attain this year. What that would you way say? we can, we can leave a comment on your video. Yes. When, you, when you get there, we're going to be like, we knew you'd reach there. Yeah. Well, what, what number would you say? I, I, it's almost like I know what it's going to be because mm. I'm, I have like linear growth where it's like the same every month. I okay. Mean, it, it, it doesn't change. So I'll get about 10,000 a year of new subs and it'll be within a thousand of that. It, oh. it, it, it just, it's kind of the way it works. So reach for 30 is what I'm seeing. 30,000. 30, <laughs> no, I'm going to reach for 11 and we'll see. Okay. All right. <laughs> I know you're going to make it. Well, Rich, what goals do you have for Arch? I know we talked about one goal. Oh yeah. I, I have one goal for the chat. Like, it will have meant that everything here was a success. It was all worth it. Mm -hmm. I want to get Stormlight 5 early. I want a review copy of Stormlight 5. That'd if I can get that, it everything was worth it. And the Which ultimate is, goal... There's no way you're getting that. <laughs> we can do it. <laughs> we have a whole year. What is this? Rich and Matt, both of you are just curmudgeons. This, what is this? What do you mean? <laughs> I'm positive. We're going to do it. Well, the, the ultimate goal, Matt, this is our whole scheme. We've since day one have been yeah. wanting to get Sander talk to Sanderson. That's going to be, that's a lofty, lofty goal. But that yeah. is, that's our measure. But ARC is the goal for this year. Let's, let's yeah. see if we can. <laughs> eh, we'll see. Uh, well, okay. There's, we're, a few, there's a few arcs where I have no hope of getting it. I'll, I'll make an attempt. Yeah. Uh, but I don't, I don't know. I'm going to, I'll try to get my hands on Stormlight, but I, I don't know, man, if you figure it out, let me know how you did it. <laughs> we're, we're doing our best. <laughs> yeah. We're mentioning it every video, <laughs> just every single time. Someone get to Sanderson, but yeah. I, I wanted to end it with that just for channel goals. Matt, Thank you so much for being on. If you want to plug anything, of course, you got your channel or conclude this. Thank you so much for having This was a blast. Rich, you had fun? Oh, it was a lot of fun. Matt, I'll let you end it off here. Yeah, no, I'm not going to do the, you know, if you want to watch my stuff, come check out the channel or, you know, just watch this one. That, that, that was par for course in how this pod went. That was great. That was great. <laughs> <laughs> Matt, thank, thanks so no, much, Matt. I appreciate it, guys. It's been awesome chatting with you guys. Uh, look forward to watching your stuff. I kind of newly came across your stuff and have been kind of consuming it a lot since, so. Awesome. Appreciate oh, you guys thanks. entertaining me with the longer format stuff and can't wait to see what's, uh, what's in store for you next year. Thank you all so right. much, Matt. Uh, likewise. And that's to the ramble. We'll see you all next week. Bye y'all. Bye. -bye.